we will start with public comments. Do we see? You can come up here, yeah. Okay. I guess it's just your name and where you live in Hi, I'm Jeffrey Mendoza. I live at 162 Lancaster Avenue. Um, I am a very, today, a very proud father of my daughter, Clyde. Um, and I'm here um, just to sort of introduce a, an idea that um, a couple of other parents and I have um, concerning the sound system in the auditorium. Um, the other two parents I've been speaking to, we all have different degrees of um, experience with um, sound reinforcement, PA systems, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, some are very stage oriented and some very technically oriented. And um, I'm sure you're all aware of all the difficulty in, um, that the kids found operating the system um, over this past year. And in the discussions that we had, basically, we understand that it's a, it's a fairly complicated system. Um, and it's unreasonable to expect that just kids or um, staff members would necessarily know how to use it. Um, it's an expensive system and obviously it's under warranty and no one wants to break it. So, um, we tried to help. I tried to help. I had, I had fly to take some pictures. Uh, we looked up the manual so that we could sort of discuss it and the next time she went in um, with some ideas to try to, to get it working better. And I've communicated with um, Superintendent Collins a little bit about it, and um, we would just like to maybe adapt a program where maybe a literally technically officially qualified person who knows how to use the equipment would be able to come in and sort of in-service the students from time to time. Um, I know in my own personal experience with um, equipment that I'm not familiar with. If someone shows me how to use it, I use it for a bit, I have a question, someone comes in at a later date, um, answers those questions, move forward that way. Um, we think it would be an excellent opportunity for the students to learn how to use the equipment. And also, um, very specifically, a, a lot of kids really, really love music and music is hard to do, to play an instrument. And I have quite a few friends who have been in that situation and have found a real love of... Um, um, one of my closest friends um, has just done sound in, in clubs. Um, he's working for a recording studio now and he just... He loves music and he plays guitar a little bit and he just struggles with that and found a place that his passion could be in, um, you know, in, in recording and doing sound and things like that. He's been very helpful to me and that's the way we do it. He teaches me things, I work with it for however long, and I call him up and say, you want to come over? And then he teaches me more, and it works really well. And um, I know the superintendent was very, has been very open to this. You know, finding the right person would be, um, would be key. But, you know, to be clear, that, that in any way that, um, that we can volunteer to help, we're willing to help, you know, volunteer for you know, whatever we can do. And, um, Another thing I really want to stress, and this isn't, um, it's, it's not to suggest anything about the IT department. The I, do, doing sound is art. It's, it's, a, it's a big part of being a musician. It's a big part of, um, it's much, much more than plugging in and making sure the tables are connected properly. And you really cannot set everything. You can't set it and forget it. For the middle school band, it's got to be, you know, you sort of have to roll with what's happening on stage now. And I just think it would be an excellent opportunity uh, for a program for the students. And we would really like to, at some future date, that works for all of us, um, maybe we could come in. There's some students I know that would like to come before the school committee. Maybe if this program is something that we're going to pursue, um, we would love to have input and the students are interested as well. So. Um, I just figured I'd come and introduce it, maybe open the door to it, and um, we can be in contact about when it would make sense, you know, to, to try to schedule to be on the agenda to come in. Um, but it really is. I the, the middle school concert. I uh, I spoke with Jeff Sheldon and said, please, please, please. Like I played in there. You don't need the PA system for the band, and he had already come to that conclusion. And I was really glad that he did because the room is acoustically awesome. You know, the band sounded great, so 
Uh, but it's a great, great system. It's got massive capabilities, you know. And it's like we just need to get to find the right person who can who can do it. Or, you know, if you want our little ragtag hand of volunteers to come in, we'll do that too, and we'll figure it out. And um, we would just like to be part of it, and we'd like to help. I think we talked about this at the last meeting, right? Um, um, that. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, definitely we're so excited about the opportunities here. And we've uh, talked about the career opportunities that, 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 that children can be yeah. exposed to. The lighting is another aspect mm -hmm. of all of this. And I know that uh, the lighting consultant was just in and spent about five hours with mm -hmm. uh, the IT folks. And that was most helpful. But once again, lighting is an artistic approach as well. So um, I, I think that uh, definitely our teachers are talking about this. The training that was provided as part of the opening up uh, was pretty minimal. Um, and there, uh, it, there's one thing in terms of just turning things on and setting things, but then there's the art connected to it. So I think we need a broader based approach. Um, certainly our teachers have talked about that. We do want the students involved. At the same time, we want to make sure that the equipment is protected um, and that, uh, you know, it's just not an open uh, forum up there in terms of who gets access. So we were going towards a, a kind of a certification kind kind of piece where um, somebody would know the system very well and then perhaps other people uh, could receive some additional training that would uh, allow them to come in and work with students because the main idea is to get the students right. in there. So I think probably this is a, a, a great opportunity for um, a task force of, of sort. I know the school committee will be supportive to that. I'm not sure what kind of uh, budget we need uh, at this point in time. I think that's something that could come out of a study committee uh, that's formed with the high school, with the music, music folks, the drama folks, the administration sitting down, um, out with the IT folks who are right now charged with uh, uh, security as well as the operation of that you know, we changed our policy and we require, if you're going to do more than just turn on the lights in the auditorium, if you're going to use that booth, um, one of our IT personnel is, is there. Um, and they know a little bit, but they don't know everything. And I, I do agree that we need some greater expertise in terms of really to, how to use that system so we get the maximum from it. And it's a spectacular auditorium and our kids do such wonderful performances and, and um, it is it's concerning to me as superintendent as well as all of us that their work is uh, supported at the utmost mm -hmm. because the sound system is squeaking or, or getting feedback or uh, those kinds of things. So we want to make it work for that, that drama part um, as well um, because I know we have lots of individual mites folks to use and the last performance I saw in there it was still hard to hear um, all the, the students lines and everything. So there's a, a work in progress definitely but we're so grateful to members of our community with the expertise and interest um, in stepping up and saying we'd like to help with this. Yeah. So I think there's a way we can put that all together in the fall. So. I think that that and if we can identify those other folks. I know a couple people have been, I've received a couple names. I ask Mr. Mackin had a couple names of folks and we ask him to contact uh, me. I haven't heard from them um, at this point in time, but uh, we kind of left it to them right. as if you would be interested, would you call? But I'm sure we can do a search of uh, folks with this technical expertise and other, um, uh, that work for other performance venues mm -hmm. that could come in and do it as well. So. Yeah, I could see getting this organization happening over the summer or whatever, and maybe whenever you guys feel ready, when you have people, when you come down and, and um, do a little bit more formal discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, for example, we just, we found in going through the manual that um, we talked about the squeaking, the feedback, the distortion. We, we found there's like six or eight places where that can be controlled that it was pretty, it's a pretty daunting system, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. And I think they received three to four hours. Right, right. On this but I think that's enough. Yeah. And that and was part of the bill. Yeah. You know, I don't think yeah. you need to have a thing where it's a class, you know, a weekly class or anything. I think that, I think if the kids can work with it, they can develop their own questions. Because I bet you anything that system will do 
I bet, I bet if you use a quarter of it, it'll do what you need, you need mm -hmm. it to do, and it can do a million other things. Um, that's how these systems are made now. <laughs> so, um, so that's all I really have today. Unless we have anything to add. But I would like to bring some kids whenever the next time is, because they're the ones who will be doing it. You know, I know there's three or four that have committed to coming. So get them involved in running up the school in the town, too. It would be an AV club. AV yeah, exactly. Point yeah. And AV exactly. club, um, when we were young, we had that. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, so it was. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. it's the same sort of idea. It's just with, I think with this, it's it's expecting a lot from the IT department, you know, for the kind of um, the kind of equipment that it is. Oh, yeah. Where I think with VCRs, it was sort of thing, and that sort of thing, it was a little, a little tricky. easier to, yeah. you know. And uh, just to be clear, I'm not the person. Um, I know what I know. <laughs> you know I, I know a lot of what's going on. I will happily volunteer to do whatever I'm, you know, I'm allowed to do. Because seriously, like, the equipment, you know, belongs to all of us. It's expensive. Um, and, um, but as far as the actual, what goes on on stage and mic placements and things like that, that's a, a place where I definitely think I should be helpful. Um, but as far as the technical aspects of what that what that system will do, finding the right person is really important to work with the IT department. Mm -hmm. um, so I just like you said, um, um, Scott Snake, uh, Dean Dean Francesco are the two main people that I've, I've spoken with. Mm -hmm. um, Dean has a lot of experience with lighting, and Scott is um, he's the high tech one of the three of us, and I, I'm the musician, right? So. <laughs> so. Between the three of us, if we can be part of it, we'd like that a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess that's it. Oh, it's my report. I don't really have a report. I'm just glad that the school year is over. It was a really long school year, and I am glad that it's over. And the finals are done. And the grades are posted. The grades are up. The grades are up. So... Um, now we have to review and approve the warrants that are on the table. Do we, do we have We don't. Or? We don't. I, have any I just have a question about one. One of them? Yep. Um, the, it's, I understand the school names are a little bit different on these. Um, it says Turkey Hill Middle School, but I believe 129 Northfield Road is the elementary, elementary school. Elementary. So it's just um, the for what looks to be 160 shirts. It's a um, white shirt, full color imprint. The bills for fourteen hundred dollars. So I'm just wondering what was that? Oh, that the Turkey was? Hill shirts they ordered. Like people ordered shirts. Okay. They had pride yeah. shirts or they think, turkey on. Yeah, I think they used that as a fundraiser that's going to help support um, the Girls on the Run program. Actually. Okay, so this was what they paid out, and then they are getting they got the money, money in. Yeah, the money from in. parents. Okay, okay. all right. Yeah. So I just wanted to double check yeah. on that. Thank you. Oh, that's the Girls on that was my understanding is what the t-shirt sales were going to be. Okay, so I just, it obviously since it, it wasn't, right. since it wasn't attached through to the, the, um, uh, through the student activity club. Right. Okay. And uh, we have, did you, we are going to review and approve the minutes. Did everyone read the minutes that they received? Did you have any comments? Um, there were a couple on the June 7th that indicated that I was here, so I... Oh, did you tell me? Yeah, I let her know. Okay. And Jim, any? No. No? So we can consider them approved? As long as um, we can make the change. Yeah. Okay. And superintendent's report? Yes. Well, we've had an outstanding uh, year and a nice close to the year. Um, we've had underclassmen awards. Uh, that Lunenburg Middle School had all their awards ceremonies. Um, uh, the students always amaze us with their many talents, and uh, I always find it um, enlightening and heartening to hear the teachers talk uh, about the reasons why uh, the students are receiving the awards. Um, and they really personalize them for the, uh, the students so often, and it um, I think it means a lot to the parents um, as well as to the students. We had a nice little eighth grade move up uh, this uh, this 
today, I heard it was this morning, that's where I was going with that. Um, and all of the students uh, were so excited about um, being the first eighth grade class and, and heading off to the high school, so many of them. Uh, some going to Monty Tech, of course, but the um, majority of the students will be moving just uh, down on the other side of the, of the building in order to um, begin their careers at Bloomberg High School. So we wish them all a happy and safe summer and a restful one. I know the teachers worked very hard to make sure that everything was accomplished by the end of the year. Schedules are out, grades are posted, grades are available. If you need hard copies, please come in and get them. Uh, we've got several exciting projects going on this summer. Our master teacher um, uh, pro projects are really beginning to take shape. Uh, a lot going on with the advancement of our curriculum, continuing to do work in our ELA uh, curriculum. This summer we'll have both science and social studies groups working. Our task forces will be in, uh, working on curriculum, working on implementation, writing units of instruction based upon the new curriculum frameworks. Um, and they'll also bring a friend. Um, uh, who will, is a grade level peer or somebody from the do, uh, department uh, to involve them in, in the writing as well. So uh, it's one of those activities that uh, I really commend the teachers for spending their summers coming in and taking care of that work and everybody's very excited about it. Uh, we're looking through master teacher projects of um, incorporating a robotics team into Lindenburg High School and also we'll continue with the SAT prep as well as curriculum adoption. Um, you know, our, our master teachers are the ones that are lead, leading the majority of our curriculum task forces um, and they continue in that effort. We're going to be doing things around mental health awareness programs as well as making sure that we're monitoring and supporting and changing any kind of chronic absenteeism patterns that are seen. So uh, by the time the fall rolls around, we'll have a full articulation of our master teacher projects. We do want to get several of them in once again this year to highlight their projects and share them with the uh, school committee as well as the public uh, because there's some amazing work uh, that's going on. We want to wish uh, Catherine Zeka, um, who retired with <coughs> two years of uh, service. She uh, uh, let us know this right after our retiree reception uh, <laughs> two weeks ago. Um, Kathy is uh, uh, certainly one of those uh, dedicated educators, uh, just a really caring professional, and she's going to be missed by all our students um, as well as parents, guardians, and her colleagues. Um, certainly wish her the very best. Uh, wish she'd let us know ahead of time, but I think it was her plan I'm to sure. exit quietly. I'm sure. I, I want you to know that we did share um, a recognition certificate, the plaque, as well as some flowers with her today before she got out the door. Um, so, um, uh, you know, one of the things Ms. Seika brought um, working uh, for the district 20 years is uh, for the last several years, she's done this wonderful, innovative newsletter to her colleagues uh, that uh, she was an avid a reader of her professional uh, journals, so uh, she'd synthesize those in any particular articles that seemed uh, very relevant for uh, the staff at the primary. She'd uh, summarize them and send that out in an email, so everybody could share that, and, wow. and that's the kind of uh, you know, professional she was, and we really thank her for her service. And I wanted to take the time, even though she wasn't able to join us for the retirees reception. So now we're up to 196 years of experience of the retirees that are departing. And of course, we uh, have made some uh, replacements um, and additions to our staff. Um, and we'll uh, be announcing those as we go along. I know the school committee is keeping updated with them. Um, and as we open school, we'll make the announcements uh, to the public as well. But we're very excited about um, the staff that is, is joining us and the energy and the innovation that they're, they're bringing and adding to the energy and innovation in our, our schools. And I also wanted to let everyone know that um, we really appreciate everybody's effort in terms of tackling uh, the 
Food service debt. Uh, I'm pleased to tell you that we've uh, collected now over $8,000 uh, of that debt. Um, there's over 63 of the unpaid balances that have been completely paid off, and so we're moving in the right direction, and I think uh, that it's been done with compassion and understanding and a focus on, on the students as well. Um, making sure that everyone is uh, receiving the nutrition that they need every day, uh, working with our parents along this. It was uh, uh, something that required all of us to do a little bit of adjustment, um, and uh, people made that effort, but the focus was kept on the students and making sure that they were taken care of. Um, and uh, the adults took care of the problem, so the students didn't have to. So um, uh, we appreciate everybody's work in that regard. And also I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that Turkey Hill Elementary School is going to have a lot of asbestos abatement uh, going on. The offices will be closed over there. Mrs. Cooney and Mrs. Champagne, when she returns uh, from her vacation, will be located in this building for a good portion of the uh, summer. So email's the best way to get them. I know Mrs. Champagne um, sent out a notification to the school community, the uh, Turkey Hill Elementary School community, uh, but we just thought the public should know as well uh, that uh, with all that work going on over there, that building, uh, the custodians uh, will be able to work in a portion of the building. There will be a containment set, uh, set up in another area of the building, and that involves the office area. Extended day is going to be at uh, uh, Pasios uh, during the summer, um, and then when the abatement project is, is completed for school to open, they'll, of course, move back uh, to Pasios for the three through five grades and down to the primary school. Extended day um, will be uh, moving back there in August during that two-week break. So. Um, that is what's going on this summer. I also wanted to call to everyone's attention that the overall attendance rate in, um, for our district uh, across the year was 95.57% attendance. So um, all of the schools uh, were over uh, 95. Um, Lunenburg Middle School actually uh, was um, for the year in total up at 96.10%. So, good attendance. That says something, I think, about what's happening in classrooms. It says something about parents um, supporting the educational program and getting the students here. Um, and it uh, certainly says a lot about the students and their engagement as well. So, great year. Thank you for all you have done in supporting our students. And we're looking forward to uh, a lot of projects this summer and then opening on new school year. Come August uh, 30th, I believe. Tw uh, 29th, actually. Teachers back to 28th. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. I do have one other um, item under superintendent's report. I just wanted to call to the public and the school committee's attention uh, of one of our final uh, budget revision requests. Um, uh, we needed to do some more projector mounting stabilization on some of the um, uh, the projectors uh, here in this building. Uh, we were having a little bit of wavering and they went through several different ways to address that problem um, and finally came up with a solution. That solution, however, came at a cost of $9,600. So that amount is being moved out of the owner's contingency um, into uh, the uh, budget fund. It, this was approved, uh, vetted, um, and approved by the building, uh, sc the school building committee. These BRRs are shared uh, with the public. They want to make sure that the uh, school committee is aware of, of these changes in, in the construction budget. Um, and also these will go on up to the Board of Selectmen. Um, we've done a few of these, very few of these actually, uh, but uh, that's the transparency. And what we asked for just is for the Chair of the School Committee uh, in triplicate to acknowledge that it was made public. So I'm going to hand this to Mrs. Raven. Any questions about that budget revision request? No? Great. And that concludes my superintendent's report tonight. And we don't have a student representative.
here with us today. Look, correct? No. Eliza and I. She celebrated. I didn't get a lot. chance to ask Daddy. her. I'm surprised, uh, Eliza. We did uh, give her a recognition. I. Uh, presented her, acknowledged her work um, in front of the high school um, student body when we did the awards oh, assembly. Um, we started doing that because the students were uh, very diligent. Yeah. Yeah. She's on summer vacation. Yeah, she's on summer vacation. 11:30. And we'll have we'll have a new one next year. Um, Eliza will continue we'll until mid-year, yes. Okay. The way we found the cycle work best for folks is uh, to do the last half and the first okay. half of the year. Okay. Um, um, things pick up for the seniors, of course, so um, that seems to be the best for Okay. for <coughs> so um, That's been our tradition. Right. School building committee report. Was there a last meeting? There's no, no meeting. No, no meeting. Okay. There was a few trickling warrants that needed to be cited, but that's about it. Okay. Okay, then um, we're going to our strategic planning update. Yes, our consultants are here. Um, Dr. Ladd is even joining us tonight. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Bob Milley, and Dr. Ladd is the director of our organization, and uh, we're pleased to have him with us here tonight. Stephanie Meeg and my colleague in the Lumen Beer Project. Uh, we worked long and hard together to put this together with your staff. So it's worked out well. We hope. Is it okay if I move this table a little bit this way? That way she could get a picture of the slide. Yep. And me too. Is mm -hmm. that okay? I'm good at this by now, maybe. Yeah, now you know how to use the table. It uses the same foot. <laughs> Does this work for you? Do you yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Does the committee have a copy of the plan? Yeah. Oh, okay. And should I give you a test on it to make sure you No. Okay. No. Okay. 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 Uh, this is the model we've been working from. And we spent a number of months working on a strategic framework and we have a special committee to do that. We established a mission and core values and then we worked on a vision once we got a little bit into the uh, core team and understood exactly what people had envisioned for the future in Lonenberg. We put that in there and that strategic framework is sort of the upfront piece uh, in the strategic plan. That's the part that really doesn't change much. Uh, we really updated the mission and core values uh, in the vision from a number of years ago, more than a decade ago. So what we've done hopefully will last another decade or more. The strategic plan is really designed to be something around five years in duration because you really can't predict much beyond that. So we have a core team that worked with that group and looking at the vision and core values, we developed goals, objectives, and identified who would be responsible for those things and have established a timeline about that. So we talked a lot about that strategic framework last time we visited. In February, was it? I think something like that. And so tonight we hope to uh, go forward with the strategic plan. But I wanted to uh, make note that individual school improvement plans, which are annual, really bounce off of that strategic plan. Given these goals for the district and these objectives we hope to accomplish, what part do the schools play? And they have to build that into their planning, along with other things that the schools do. But there has to be an alignment there so that everybody's moving in the same direction. So those school improvement plans have their role. And then we monitor, assess, update all that. And there's a cycle there that really hopefully makes project for the, the district. So uh, it's a real plan. The plan isn't pie in the sky. It isn't something that will never happen. Uh, we, we hope it doesn't get put on a shelf. I don't think it will. We're pretty sure that there was too much involvement and interest to have that happen. But we do want you to see how the school improvement planning uh, feeds into that kind of thing. So instead of going through everything in that plan, is it 40 odd pages? Yeah. We tried to be selective. We uh, established some goal areas, and we're going to talk about some major objectives uh, under those goal areas. And after each goal area, we, you could ask questions anytime you want. And at the end, there'll be a chance to ask anything else that you didn't, we didn't get to, or you have an inquiry about. 
So these are the, the goal areas. Uh, and again, note that this is a plan of the Lunenburg Public Schools. It's not our plan, it's your plan. We hope we captured all the ideas. Uh, it was very participatory, and uh, we hope that you understand that this is what your staff thought was very, very important. So, what about Stephanie, start off with? Okay, I'm going to uh, go through the first two goal areas. The first one has to do with social and emotional learning and making the environment of the school safe places for kids to learn. One of the, the, the new learnings that have happened in the last 10 years, and it was very clear that all the members of the planning committee were very in tune to this, is the enormous interplay between the social and emotional learning of children, the culture of the school as a safe place, and academic performance and learning. So in those olden days, we just looked at tests and test scores. Now we realize that if we're really going to promote our kids working to the best of their abilities, we have to look at the whole person, the whole child. And that's where social emotional learning and safe environments come in. Uh, in. Under goal one, the major objectives, the first three bullets there have to do with very specific research-based programs that the uh, members of the district had gone out and found out about and learned more about and in many cases had already started in the initial stages of implementation. So uh, district-wide they're going to be using the RULER program which is based out of a Yale initiative on social emotional learning and social um, what they call emotional intelligence and developing that in young people. Uh, K through five, they've already started on the responsive classroom program, which again is very in keeping with these same kinds of ideas. Uh, children being able to go inside themselves, describe what's going on in their feelings, being able to communicate that to other people, to be able to develop strategies for avoiding conflict, and then when conflicts arise, uh, how do you resolve those in successful ways. Um, impulse control. I mean there's a whole range of, of strategies there that young people need to learn and it's so nice that you're starting very early with the K through 5 group on that. And then the middle school has begun doing some work on the developmental designs and it's really a whole school approach to social emotional learning and also recognizing that as young people get older they need to be involved in the decisions that affect their lives and so they're engaged in, in rule making and, and participating in decision making as an empowering thing along with the social emotional learning. So those three programs, as they go into full implementation, that will affect not only the interplay between students and students and staff, but it'll also create the atmosphere where learning, which is such a social thing, is promoted and sustained and supported over time. Uh, the other two bullets there, one has to do with just that revisiting of the anti-bullying policy. Uh, as you know, there was legislation several years back uh, to really address this statewide. And uh, this district, the Lunenburg District, did due diligence with that and developed a policy. And it's important every once in a while to go back and take a look and take a look at each school level <coughs> program and how they are doing in terms of uh, prevention in terms, by the way, all those social emotional programs do a lot for that because they're, they're really helping, helping kids to be able to develop the social skills. Uh, that, but also then when there is an is incident, how do you protect the person who has been victimized? How do you report it? How do you do interventions and remediations with children that need that? And then how do you do the data collection so you can really see how those things are working in your schools? So it's just nice to touch base on those, have each school to go in and look at how we're doing. Are there any areas that we want to strengthen? And so that's what that particular objective has to do with. Then K through 12, one of the concerns in terms of just the mental uh, and emotional well-being of kids is recognizing that life is stressful. It's stressful for staff. It's stressful for the students. 
And we all know as, as kids get into older grades, too, there's that added stress of what are they going to do beyond their 12th year here, and whether it's college or a vocational thing, career choices and things like that. And the ability to manage stress, to set priorities, to have tools and strategies that allow them to stay centered and calm is such an important mental health skill. And so as they go forward, there is an interest in putting some, some more things in place, some more supports in place, and understanding. Part of that, and this came up in our discussion, uh, state in the state, there has been um, a data collection uh, process, uh, and it's called the YRBS surveys, and it stands for Youth Risk Behavior Surveys. And the reason this ties into stress is it can give you some really good data about what is of concern to kids that, that's causing them maybe to lose sleep or to uh, feel that life is too overwhelming. Um, and it also gives you an idea of those kids that do have strategies that work, what do they do? And so it's really helpful because you have data and then also if you do it longitudinally over time, every two years, then you see trends. And it gives you a really good focus for what your prevention education and your health education <coughs> programs are going to be going forward. So uh, I recommend that to you. Are there any questions on this, uh, these aspects of uh, goal number one? Or anything that was also the strategic plan. We didn't cover every single one of them. I shared everything you possibly could. Okay. I think the, the only question I have is the method of data collection. In, in, are you talking about the YRBS? Yes. Uh, that is, there's surveys and there's models of those surveys that come from the state. Um, I work in my own three communities of Boxford, Topsfield, and Middleton, and we have done longitudinally this this stuff and it really gives you a very good sense of what it is and we tinker with it a little bit each year because you get you, you know you you find out what your community issues are you it's know anonymous. and it's all anonymous by the way and it's all done by permission so your parents can opt out and so it's you there's no connecting that particular child with that data okay. Thank you. and then there, civic learning. The next goal is about civic learning and engagement. Um, two major changes in the curriculum frameworks, in the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks, one was in that social emotional learning and building that into every single curriculum framework that's coming out. And the other part was this civic, uh, civic learning and engagement. And it was recognizing that although we were doing some stuff in social studies that we've always done in social studies, I was a social studies teacher, uh, there seems to have been a slippage in what we would call civic education. You know, how does our government work? What is our role as a citizen? How do we become informed citizens so that we can make good choices and influence the laws that come out in our communities? And so uh, there have been identified at the state level very specific um, civic competencies that they feel every young person should have going forward into their adult lives. And the idea is to embed those into the K through 12 curriculum. And so there would be civic uh, learning units and projects that would be developed to support that. And another component of this is this whole idea of service projects. They are members of a community, the Lunenburg community. And in order to feel that they belong, it is important that they feel that they can be of service to their community. This is a very important developmental stage. It's not just all about you. It's about us as a community and making those connections very strong for children and, and uh, all through K through 12. So there's going to be some service projects through K through 8 and many of those would probably be uh, cross-discipline. There would be collaboration across the disciplines in these service projects. 
And then at the high school, the goal is to encourage to develop uh, models of them, protocols on how they do them, with the idea that all kids as they go through the high school would have this opportunity to, to do a service project in their community and or, or do community hours of service. So I, that's the nature of that. Is there any questions on this area? This is fairly new, by the way. It used to be always part of American history and civics, you know, but it, it's a fairly new in the new curriculum frameworks. Did the teachers talk to you, I'm just looking at um, this, in terms of the service projects and engagement projects, um, did the teachers talk to you about the things that they have going on already and being being able to, because some, some things are coming to mind that we already do yes. in terms of building on those? Yes. Okay. And I, I think the idea is to build a, almost like a portfolio of things. Some may be doing class-wide projects. Okay. Some might be individual or team projects. And gradually just get a really good portfolio and then probably mix them, you know, change them out so there's not redundancy and, and new learnings that come up or new opportunities that come up in the community that weren't available to them. Okay. But there's, there was obviously things going on and now we, the idea that was shared with me is we wanted to be a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. It's just what we do as part of our K through 12 experience. Okay. We'll be switching back and forth. Right. Not too many times. Yeah. But I'm pleased. I sit there and I'm smiling because of the social, emotional learning and the well-being of students. Yeah. Right. That ripple through our core values, that ripple through the vision and mission of who you are, the idea of good citizenship that was on everybody's mind as something important and what should be part of Lunenburg. And when this emerges, it, it's like, you know, we did our job. We, we built it the right way from that framework on us. And uh, it isn't by accident that the social, emotional learning and these kinds of things are goals one and two. I commend all of you and your staff to say that this is what we find near and dear, that unless we have these pieces in place, uh, does really great learning happen? You know, I guess there was an understanding about uh, how these things fit in. Well, three, curriculum aligned with the mass frameworks. Now, Massachusetts frameworks, you know, the science frameworks came out last year, and they were quite different from what happened before. Stephanie mentioned social studies frameworks coming out, and, and with more with civics. Uh, ELA and, and math are being revised now and should be finished this year. These are totally new frameworks, so not, not too much of a departure in some cases. But these things are new and we're expected to respond to them and uh, you know, standardized assessments will be based upon these new things. So a lot is happening and you probably know that the process uh, for curriculum development here in Lunenburg is through variable teams. When we say establish a cyclic process, the process has been more or less established. What the plan asks for, as you read in more detail, is that we document this process. We talk about how it works so that there's no drift over time. It works extremely well here. We saw that. We visited that. Uh, it allows you to do a lot of different things at once because different teams are working on different stuff. So there's movement uh, going forward in all of these areas. But documenting that so that you can look at it and strengthen it would be an important step, we feel. And I mentioned the implementation is, uh, for updates is happening in those four areas kind of simultaneously. Uh, the state is really wrestling with how do you do all these things at once and what's the burden on schools? And how they do MCAS or the PAC exams will take into account that it takes time to get into all these different areas uh, uh, kind of at the same time or at least in the same half decade. So those things are going on. Uh, different teams and subject areas are, are in different places. Social studies is pretty much wrapped up. They've done marvelous work. You'll see a lot of that stuff unveiled next year. But for the most part, the plan deals with the details of what the resources are, what units will be taught in all these different areas, uh, what kind of ongoing communication is necessary from one grade level to the next to the next to make it all work. And then all about the assessments here. There's a lot that needs to be tied together. But again, the detail is in the plan. It's the kinds of things you think about, the professional development needs, that sort of thing. But those things are going strong. Uh, again, in a number of districts, you'd find this to be 
sort of the core of everything a district might do is look at those test scores and so forth. Lunenburg is very much interested in the whole child and how all that plays out. Uh, the third bullet, expand cross curricular STEAM, the A in STEAM is arts. Science, technology, engineering, arts, math, instruction, and learning. But the cross curricular stuff was important at every level. No matter which group we talked to, uh, people saw the need for things being project based, involving more than one curriculum area. Uh, being creative, uh, you know, dealing with a lot of different learnings in the kid's mind at the same time, connecting things, uh, tie together the curriculum instead of making them silos. All of that is in the plan. You're headed in that direction. That's what vertical teams do. Uh, very impressive. And it's moving forward and it's part of the plan and it's a very important part of the plan. As we do that, we've got to look at the common assessments. Uh, that some subject areas have where teachers all give the same assessment to see what's happening. We've got to align those things as well as uh, uh, units and lessons to uh, the new frameworks as well. So there's a lot to be done there. It's moving forward. I saw nothing to be alarmed about. Uh, I thought I saw a lot to be proud about. Uh, but that's going on. Uh, the well, last bullet, consider world language electives. We've heard that a few times, and I understand that some things are going on in terms of world language in the middle school. Uh, that would be a great thing. Uh, it's something that the committee has to think about. Uh, those kinds of things uh, take staffing, they take resources, and a lot of thinking about what works well. So that's part of the plan and uh, what's happening. It's, uh, I painted that with a very big brush, the curriculum, but. Uh, the details of what you might expect them to be, I urge you to, to read on, about those in the plan. Uh, so do you have any questions on the curriculum piece? No questions? No snide remarks? Nothing? No, oh, okay. Very good. Digital literacy is the other side of that coin. Talking about computer science curriculum and instructional technologies. Uh, we heard a lot about the need to develop a curriculum map for what we expect students to know and be able to do with technology. Uh, it's got to be specified. You don't create this from nowhere. There are national curricula, ISTE, ISTE, and then the state has some uh, digital curricula to offer for suggestions as well. Districts vary in this with the ability to provide those technologies uh, to kids, whether you have uh, an urban district or you have schools that are small and spread out or whether you have schools that can combine these things so that all students benefit. But uh, they found that the curriculum map deciding what it is students should know would be a good first step, and it is. The second bullet, expanding blended learning strategies. I don't know if you know what blended learning is. It's traditional teaching, right? It's uh, uh, how you might imagine it. But it's blending in the technology in a way that reinforces the, ter uh, the traditional approaches to curricula as well. So a blend of technology and uh, engagement and ways that students can indeed create their own learning uh, is an important part of the plan. And that should happen from kindergarten all the way up to 12. And there are good things happening with limited resources. Uh, people have found some things that are very workable in the primary school, uh, elementary school, uh, middle school has courses, so, but they have a technology course structure as well. But there was concern about professional development with instructional technologies that some teachers know a whole lot more than others which of course is, is more or less natural. But making that a level playing field and uh, finding out what teachers should know as well and making sure that uh, one teacher knows as much as the other. The fourth bullet, consider an instructional technology specialist. Well, let's have five of them if you could afford them, but we know what that kind of thing costs and uh, what it takes to make that work. But that was in the plan uh, and hopefully that can happen over time where you provide and give teacher support at different grade levels. Uh, look at equity because uh, you kind of, some teachers able to do all these great things and other teachers may not have access to the equipment or may not have the ability to work with that. Making sure that somebody's in charge of overseeing that and making it work out so that things are moving forward for everyone, somebody overseeing those things. Develop a multi-year technology plan. Uh, uh, instructional technology plan. Well, uh, that's something that every district should probably do. Uh, not slated to happen next year, but I think maybe the year after, where we look at where we are as a district. In creating a vision, what do we want 
elementary classrooms to look like? What do we want to happen in the middle school, the high school? Uh, what equipment do we have now? If we have limited resources, where do we put those resources? What kind do we get? So establishing that vision is an important part of that. Uh, it was expressed that projection devices might be important in uh, the elementary and primary. One-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, internet connective devices in classrooms at the secondary level was an important goal. The high school has accomplished that in a couple of grades already, and they're trying to do more. Uh, that's all headed in the right direction, as in devices that can be used to do that have become more available, cheaper, and uh, many, many kids have uh, those kinds of things at home. There was some talk also about uh, adding some courses in technology in the high school to kind of plant the seeds is something that might serve as the basis for a college decision or even a, a career decision, that kind of thing. Got to plant some seeds if you want those flowers to grow. So thinking about uh, what programs might be, it might be graphic design, it could be a lot of different things. It could be some spreadsheet stuff, could be a lot of stuff, but uh, that would be thought out as one does a multiple tech year technology plan. So there's good stuff to be done. Your people are eager, and yet they're patient not to do it wrong. And maybe to get the curriculum revision down first and say, well, this is what we want. Then think about how do we get the technology to support that in the best way. Any questions on that piece? Huh? I think you can probably envision what might happen. And there are lots of examples of schools that have had the resources and time to look into that. You don't have to create, create right from scratch. You can, you can go see and go learn from others about what works best in schools, so that's kind of a good thing. Professional development, goal five, improving professional development at school level and at the district level. And one of the major things was to pre-plan this so that what happens in schools and district-wide, everything is kind of connected. So what we're doing in maybe the primary school is a, a logical beginning for what you might want to have happen in the elementary school and then moving up the ladder there. It's really a call in that first bullet for, for multi-year thinking. Where do we want to be in a couple of years? How do we get that? What do we do next year? What do we do the year after? To move things in a way that, so that everybody's rowing in the same direction. Second bullet talks about prioritizing professional development activities. Having some process for doing that kind of the year before. Getting some focus. Knowing what major curriculum initiatives need that support right away and making that come together. So that's a, a, an issue of focus. The third bullet, it talks about expanding uh, grade level common planning time. That is grade three teachers meet together, grade five meet together. How do you do that in a way that they can get more time so that they can talk about the new curricula? Think about technology. Writing is a big area where teachers really have to talk about the prompts, how to correct those uh, teacher uh, student responses in a, in, in a way that uh, is uh, in common, uh, using the same language in a lot of curriculum areas, how to share resources, lots of reasons for teachers to meet in grade levels and get together. It's not a matter of snapping one's fingers though because it takes a lot of hard scheduling and a lot of thinking uh, on the part of the principal to make that happen. Where Maybe in some cases we have some alternate acti activities, group activities, and so forth, the students while this happens. But those are things that uh, we're, we were engaged with in professional development discussions. Um, I just want to make sure that, and I just noticed the difference between your slide and our, oh, okay. our document, yeah. is that we are hoping to have the goal be to provide common grade level yeah. planning time. <laughs> Um, and that shows up in the actual strategic plan as well on yeah. page 33. Yeah. So you just want to make sure that that is something yeah. that is yeah. providing right. it, not just expanding uh, it, pro providing right. it. These is, things were okay. condensed to fit on a slide. Okay. So I, I talk about goal areas and, right. and how to pick them on the bullets. Okay. But expand and provide. Okay. We, we talked about that uh, in the meeting where we talked about initiating that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And principal said we already do some of that. That's why you have yeah. to expand. Okay. So right. that Perfect. came is a. I just want to know how important it is for point. teachers to have right. that. So yeah. I'm glad yeah. it's in there. But it is right in the plan. It's yeah. stronger in the plan. It is, yeah.
I had a question yeah. about the, how um, professional development needs were determined. I think I'm understanding this, but the leadership teams, that's where the teachers are providing input on what they believe they need right. to meet the goals? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they have to communicate with the vertical teams, too, in terms of where you are and what the expectations of teachers are going to be uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. So it takes some involvement there. I think initially we talked about creating a separate body that would think about those things and then communicate with principals and teams. But it was sort of like adding a step to a process that already had a couple of steps. So we, we thought that and we think that what you have in place with uh, the teacher leaders uh, and the principals and having a plan in front of you to say, what do we want to accomplish? We'll get that done. So that's what we believe will happen here. I'm convinced of that. What's the next one? Goal seven. Do you want to take it? Oh, okay. What's yours? Six. six. Oh, six. I didn't do six. Oh, okay. Very good. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Instructional support for struggling learners. A lot of this focused around response to interventions, RTI, uh, which is a process for helping students who are not special ed students, but yet who are still struggling having a hard time getting and keeping pace with the uh, other students in the classrooms. And there was discussion about, the, there's a lot of things in place. Things have happened, things are going on. But uh, uh, teachers talked about expanding uh, the, um, the kind of interventions that would work well. Some of them have gotten tired, some of them don't seem to work. What else is out there? And you know, interventions and processes for interventions you know, come about every year we, with technology, uh, with what we learn from other districts, use of data systems, that kind of thing. But uh, the word audit is accurate here. Look at what we do now. What do we need improvement with? And again, getting more interventions uh, on the table to look at was one of them. But start, starting with that and then thinking about how to improve going forward. Professional development on RTI, which was talked about as being important for K-5 to teachers, that some teachers do it well. New teachers come in and they struggle with that because nobody sits down necessarily and says, new teacher, you obviously know how to do this. They don't. They don't know the strategies here and how all that works. And other teachers work it well and other teachers need help and have questions. There's a need for collaboration on that that was expressed over and over again. That we can make this better. We're doing okay. We can make it better. And the first two bullets uh, hit that point. The third bullet, increase K-5 literacy support personnel. Uh, that bounces back and forth with the fifth bullet. Consider guidelines for reasonable class size. Class size, in some instances, is high now, this year, this past year. Hard to get at those kids who need tier two or a double dose of reading, that kind of thing. It's very challenging, even with some aids in the room, it's difficult. But, you know, one strategy would be to consider decreasing class size. That takes staffing. Another strategy would be, well, you know, if you have a teacher, you know, that can decrease class size, but really is that going to have a strong impact? Should there be more K-5 to literacy support personnel for the same buck? Where do you get the most for your dollar here? I say both. You probably have to think about doing both of these things if you really want to make a dent uh, and improve literacy in your uh, elementary years. So they're both on the table uh, to think about. Uh, somehow you might say class size is not something we can do in 2017-18. Maybe not the year after because we see what's happening with the growth in student population. But meanwhile we can increase what goes on in classrooms to help teachers. Or you could say class size is something we can do now. And maybe we don't need so much literacy support personnel but maybe looking down the road to where those hot spots might be. So there's that, that tension between those two ideas and the best way we could handle it was to mention both and to give some strong thought, the principals, superintendent, about how this would work best. You should have a lot of questions about that, no? What do you think? That next only question is, you know, limited resources both in space, well, money, right. and, yeah. and uh, right. available teachers, yeah. so. It's tough. It's in fact, it is obvious. Even, even the space for remediation to carry out something else happening for tier two, tier three students, these are all issues. And uh, 
when you put great minds together, sometimes you come up with what the solutions might be. But there's a lot of talk about this, there's a lot of understanding on it, and the committee has to think about it too. And we've made progress with these in the coming year. Yeah. Um, with additional monies, there were choices made um, in the primary school uh, regarding regarding reducing classroom size yeah. down there. Yeah. And middle school foreign language was also ah, um, decision was made there around right. some some additional money yeah, so that that program yeah. could be saved and is actually revamped to look at it in what could be a potentially more productive way after having it yeah. this year. So. It's good to see some of the things that that you're bringing up. Yeah. You know, beginning to work through already, and. Yeah. You know, when we met in the schools, talking about those things, and having, it, each moment, Stephanie, you worked in the primary, I worked in the elementary. They loved being able to express these ideas and put them in the plan and getting in, in front of the whole community, including the people, of course. To get it on the table is is powerful issues that have to be thought about. And uh, having thought about them already to some degree, you know, we're in sync here. Teachers are looking for help in certain areas, and you're very willing to provide that. I was a, an assistant principal for a lot of districts and acting superintendent, too. I always thought the best money is spent at the you know, elementary level in literacy, because any problems that are created down there, you're paying for those all the way through. You know, Take care of the problems where the happening and where they have the most impact. But I think uh, these uh, ideas for instructional support were on target. I think they did well. Now, Steph? Yes. Uh, well, this next uh, goal, goal number seven, has to do with enrichment opportunities. And it was very clear from the uh, groups that we've worked with that they recognize the importance of engaging kids in the arts and creative engagements after school and particularly identifying what are the high interest. Because interest can change, you know, as student populations change, there will be a different emphasis. And some things may be emphasized one year and they're not emphasized three years later. Uh, so the idea here under the objectives is to uh, review and expand these enrichment activities. Perhaps taking surveys of students' interests, you know, and see what's out there. Also, it's important to see what's available uh, in other communities, you know, what kinds of things are, are very uh, motivating for kids. There's, in, in, de in developmental psychology, uh, there's this idea of sparks. And sparks are those passions that kids have to do or engage or learn about something. Very often it's those sparks that keep kids engaged in school rather than dropping out even. You know, it's, it's what, say, I get to go to th tomorrow, you know, I can't wait. So finding out what those sparks are very often has to do with your enrichment, your broad-based enrichment activities that you provide for kids. I'll just give you some examples of things that came up. Um, uh, literary publications, poetry clubs, fine arts, um, that like things like the Science Olympiad and Model UN and robotics and competitive math teams, you know, those kinds of activities. So it's not just athletics is what they were trying to get at, you know, the groups that we were talking and engaging. Uh, sports are very important and can be just the right match for the right kids. For other kids, they may want more diversity. So finding out what those things are. Uh, in the middle school, there was a desire to uh, reestablish the athletic opportunities. It was, you know, as I did some research about Lunenburg, there are some things that go on in the community, you know, that feed some of those needs. So it's, a, uh, it's like, where do you want to put your resources for these kids? You know, do you want to look at what's out there and then say, okay, let's do something supplemental here at the high school and middle school, as the case may be, and even the elementary school. And there was also an interest in identifying and expa expanding resources for online personalized learning. Again, when kids have sparks for them to be able to access that just-in-time learning uh, through all the incredible richness of online personalized instruction that can be made available through, to uh, them over time. Any questions on, on this one? 
Okay. We probably should go forward. Good. And this has to do with our collaborations and communications in the community and among the schools and throughout out there. And, and one of the things that I was delighted to hear came right up to the top is you now have these beautiful new buildings. One of the ways to sustain support for the schools over time is indeed getting the entire community involved in using the facilities for lifelong learning. And that, I believe there was even a study committee, right, from the school committee that was looking into that and collaborating with the, so you guys are way ahead of the curve. That is so important to get the ongoing support from the populace when they say it's not their schools, it's our schools. So I was delighted to hear that that came up so strongly from folks. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we heard from some folks out there was that uh, a particular teachers or particular schools may be, have more robust ways of communicating with uh, the community, usually parents, but the community at large. And so the idea of looking to develop sort of what are kind of going to be a standard, you know, what are going to be our protocols, what kind of tools are we going to use? Because if you can put yourselves in the shoes of a parent who maybe has a second grader, a eighth grader, and a uh, junior in high school, if there's none, some, not some continuity, they won't know where to go or how to get the information that they need to get. And so the easier you can make that, the more uh, streamlined it can be, the better for communicating with the community using those protocols. Uh, there was also a desire for more intercommunication among staff, and particularly specialist staff and regular staff, you know, that, that whole thing. And um, I know when I was a middle school teacher many moons ago, uh, we had about once a month we had time to meet with all the specialists that were working with our teams. You know, so we had an opportunity to do that. But it's not easy. And so that could be electronically or it could be through other forms of communication. But it just it helps with the collaboration. Especially if you're doing project-based learning, you need to have time to do the collaborations. And then the last bullet was this idea of expanding the awareness of college and career and vocational opportunities among the, uh, the secondary students. And, you know, fairs, and I know you do trips out to other schools, and you might work collaboratively with other schools. But it's just, again, getting kids to think about what it's going to be after high school, you know, and so that they can, it's, it's really that sense of planning for the future and being totally present in the present time so that they get the requirements that they need, so they see what the options are. And it, in a community that is diverse, such as Lunenburg is, parents are not always able to give the guidance on that. Uh, they may need more support than that in order to know what their options are. That came from students as well. Yes, it did. Uh, so this wasn't just. A I believe one of your school committee members oh, right. yeah. also mentioned that when yeah. we were at the February meeting. This is you. Oh. <laughs> oh, did you have any questions on that? I'm sorry. The enrichment activities. Okay. Any final questions and comments? I think I mentioned this last in the last meeting that I thought it was very well put together, very comprehensive plan. Um, there are some some goals that are a little uh, I don't know I, I don't want to use the word flighty, but they're not specific um, or how we would we would go about measuring accomplishing these goals. Yes. Uh, you wouldn't measure the goals so much because they're ongoing and will be around for five years. If you look at the objectives. As they can be measured by all of the strategies and activities, did you really do this? And there are ways of looking at this stuff. In fact, we've been talking about this stuff with George. Uh, uh, that we have dealt with uh, school districts about how do you measure that after a year? How do you go into that and see what's done and not done? And it's a process uh, that a school district ought to do. What ought not happen is have that put away and never be discussed again, or maybe pull it out once a year. You've got to get a look at this, and you've got to think about are these important things to you, 
than visit it uh, once, twice a year, especially near the end or in the springtime, and say, hey, what have we done? What do we need to do? What didn't we talk about in a goal that we ought to have added to our plan? So it's electronic. Think about that. It's up here. And you can change it. You can think about how to rearrange things. You can replace one thing with another. You can put a brand new goal in. There's a lot to be done, but uh, uh, the strategies and activities are a good level to see. If you, if you haven't done the stuff, you're not going to get an outcome. So see if you've done the stuff and look at the objective and see how much you've contributed to that. So it's important to do that. Sure, it, it, and it's a good framework, and I like how it ties in the individual school improvement plans that we've, yeah. we've also right. uh, had an opportunity to look at. Uh, and again, those things are often in the district. Haven't we seen that many times, George? We is a district plan. Here are the school plans. Wait a second. No, they don't relate. They've got to relate. Right. Uh, I appreciate that the um, description is a dynamic blueprint. Um, I think that the exciting thing about this document is that some of the things, as Wendy said before, we've already started to do. Yeah. So there are several things here that I feel um, we could confidently start checking off in terms of outcomes. Um, you know, the adding a first grade teacher, you know, I've, I've received an email asking my for a survey on the RTI interventions at the primary school this year, all these little things that are happening that we can go here, but then we also can follow this along. And I think that that's always a good start when you can look at this kind of a document and see what you're already doing to head you in the right direction. It's, it's that springboard to get, us, to get us to where we need to be. So I just wanted to thank all of the people that worked so hard on this. I know that it's a long process, and and thank you for being a part of it, and Meredith as well, and, and the yeah. community members. Yeah, you hit them on the head. Uh, Meredith remembers that as we look at anything here, we talk about what's in progress now. You know, what do we have to finish up? What do we build on? That's one of the first questions because you don't want to be doing all this stuff and have all brand new stuff here. Right. You've got to make it work together. Um, just piggybacking off what both of you have said, I know some of the school improvement plans, and most of them were holding on to pieces. They were continuing goals that they had already set because they were waiting for this document. Yeah. And I think that they'll feel good about yeah. discussions that they talked about but didn't quite yeah. put it on paper because they wanted to see this, that they will be able to mm -hmm. either check off or say, we've done most of this. What's that one more thing we can do to yeah. wrap that one up yeah. and then move on to the next piece? Now, a simple so. little piece to do that is on the school improvement plan template, have a little column that expresses what district goal or objective it links to. Now some things may be just specific to that school, you know, or, but if it does link to something, it would be good to, to have a way to mention that on the plan. Okay. Well, no more questions. Well, I'll tell you, it's been a marvelous experience working here. I can speak on behalf of Stephanie. And George gave us, giving us a lot of guidance about the nature of the community, the kinds of things they're looking at. Uh, he had the pulse. And he was, although he was in Florida for a couple of months, he got this well, he stuff. Didn't have the <laughs> <laughs> he was an You were doing landlord. so good for so long. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think <laughs> Take that off the table. Can you cut that? Can you help me out? Yeah. George, we know you're in Florida. <laughs> uh, just one comment I'd just like to make is that one of the things that was sort of unique about Lunenburg, and we've done district planning yeah. throughout the United States, yeah. so one of the things that was rather unique is how you have school level curriculum leadership groups, and that's that you know your your vertical teams and your horizontal teams and all that. That's very huge because what you're doing is you're developing leaders. That's what you're doing. You're developing leaders and saying, yes, you have the wherewithal to make some decisions and guide this process. And um, I, I, we've seen that in a couple different places. Uh, and it's very, but it's very special. And I want to congratulate you on, on using your resources, your people who are your best resources in this community. Now, Loxy, early on in the process, said she insisted upon a lot of participation and involvement. And we think we got that. But often in a school district, that's sometimes numbers. It wasn't numbers here. It was passion. Uh, we had roomfuls of people who were really interested in all this stuff and contributed a lot. We're going to miss them, by the way. We had a lot of great <laughs> meetings. We had a lot of wonderful people. 
but uh, we, we leave extremely impressed. See how it's going. <laughs> but thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to take a moment to thank our consultants, George, Bob, Stephanie, for all the work and uh, effort that you put into this. I know that that uh, uh, throughout this process you've been so responsive to us as we've said, you know, we don't feel that this is quite, uh, we're not articulating, we're not a communicating here and you always work with us to get it to where the staff needed it to be. Right. Um, and uh, there's a lot of energy already around this plan. Yeah. I know the school committee is going to be sure. have a couple meetings this summer that we can talk about it some more and sure. we're going to get it out there to our public and once uh, the fall starts it's going to be uh, front and center. Um, with a final adoption coming shortly afterwards because we do want to hear from our community is our timing is a bit off with summer we ended school uh, today um, so uh, we look forward to reporting back to you how your plan has assisted us you know where George lives you can find <laughs> yes, yes, we know how to find you <laughs> thank you again And now we're the fourth waivers. We are. And Mr. McCullough can move the table back. Or the, the, uh, Mr. McCullough, you've been um, at a competition all day today. Will you update us? I yeah. think at New England. Thank you. So we started our sports program last August 19th. And we finished it today, June 21st. We had um, New England. High School Golf Championships and yeah. sophomore Emily Nash yeah. finished fourth. Wow! wow. Congratulations. She awesome. shot a 74. Wow. Oh, wow. Our 72 wow. course, she was three strokes off from winning the competition. And had she competed on the boys' side, because she normally, right. we don't have a girls' right. team, she competes in the fall on a boys' team, yeah. she would finish 10. Okay. So wow. that was among there was wow. well with the best golfers from each state and we were invited to the competition. And, um, wow. It was fantastic. Um, just a really terrific kid, um, and she really is a, a superb athlete and a fantastic student as well. So it's really a, a nice, yeah. a nice combination. Yeah. We have a lot of those, so it's great to see someone who works as hard as she does to uh, perform at that level. She was there last year as well, so. She improved her position and uh, she still has two more opportunities to go there. So I really expect at some point she will probably be the uh, New England champion in golf. So it's really something uh, special. Thank you. She's amazing. Yes. Quite remarkable. Yeah. Um, so I was a little uh, behind the ball on getting all this information you asked for. And uh, actually, this was. Uh, the hard work of uh, Mrs. Steele, oh, yeah, who okay. I was quite amazed that she was able to pull this okay. together <laughs> as quickly as she did. Yeah, yeah. As I was riding around on a golf cart, she was working hard. <laughs> so I want to make sure you know that. Thank you. That was a nice idea. It was so hard. So I had a first look at this, and okay. um, I think uh, at least. The first two items that you asked for, yeah. and I can talk about the other two okay. items that aren't specifically uh, here, but uh, I think um, you're interested in the number of seasons per sport. Uh, if you look at that first page, uh, going from left to right would be each of our seasons, yeah. and those were the seniors on the team. Year, so. Yeah. Um, we did have, we are losing a lot of seniors that are graduating. Um, and then she broke down each of the grade levels and the participation level by the juniors, the sophomores, the freshmen, uh, down to even oh, okay. seventh graders that were on our girls softball team this year. Oh, wow. Great. So, um, And then on the, the last section of information is what our teams looked like last year. Uh, where it says 2016 fall sports, we had 15 boys on the varsity soccer team. We had 18 on the JV soccer team. 
So we're looking at 12 seniors return, or 12 students from last year's varsity team returned. Does not necessarily mean they, you know, they'll all have to compete for those positions again. But uh, we have uh, 12 boys returning to the varsity that were members of the varsity soccer team last year. Potentially 12. Right. Our signups are. I would like to say we get all of our students to come in and sign up, but we don't. Um, it does give us some indication of which programs are stronger going in, uh, and uh, none of them hit the maximum last night or Monday night, but we're close, and uh, certainly field hockey, there's still a, a tremendous interest in field hockey. So um, my uh, plan was to submit our waiver applications to the district chairman and the MIA for our fall sports and then look at those again as we did last year when we get into August and uh, I took I asked the Midwest League for a vote of this in May asked them to vote to approve that's the first step you have to get your leave to approve you're asking for an eight day waiver I asked for a vote they gave us a, as they have done in the past a blanket approval with the understanding that we will not use any eighth graders if we do not approve them. And that's how we've operated the last couple of years. So uh, last fall, we did need eighth graders in a number of sports. We did need them in a few sports, so we used them where we needed them, and I think it worked out pretty well. Um, I can tell you that a couple of sports, um, cross country would definitely need them. Uh, and a couple of sports are kind of unaffected by the eighth grade as far as um, there's no loss of opportunity for students in, in cheering or in cross country. We could literally have 500 kids on our cheering squad. Uh, there's no limits, there's no competitive disadvantage, it, it, it would work out fine. We can take as many students on cross country and um, cheering as we want. We don't displace any students. Um, there's no limits. Um, not true in our other sports programs. There are limits with playing time and there are limits with opportunities and we don't want to take that away from our high school students. In fact, that is one of the basic rules EMIA has and I have to send them rosters for the last two years. A number of students returning and things like that when I, when I present the argument for the waivers. So um, those are the things we have to look out for is uh, maintaining the opportunity for our 9 through 12 students by using the availability of 8th grade students to make sure our programs can continue. And I think softball this year was a terrific <coughs> example of that. Without those 7th grade students, there was no JV softball team. And what happens down the line is when there's no JV team, as we have seen, I think our girls soccer team is a good example of that. A couple of years ago, we had no JV girls soccer team. And for the last several years, our program has taken a dip in its wins and right. because yeah. of that lack of, and, and that's what we're trying to avoid when we have eighth graders on the team is keep that continuity of kids with experience moving up to varsity so we don't have these gaps where suddenly we have a couple of years where uh, we have a lot of very young kids on our varsity team with no experience. So it's ideal if we have you know, the largest group is seniors and then juniors and some sophomores and freshmen. Not a tremendous number of one class. Um, I think we see that example with our boys track team this spring. It was a huge senior class of boys. Yeah. More than 50% of the team just graduated. Um, and that is going to make next year, there's a lot of interest among the 8th graders and 7th graders who are on the middle school team that would be eligible, but numbers are one thing and success is another. So you, you kind of, you know, ideally we wouldn't have those huge classes followed by very small classes, but sometimes that's how it works. Um, Thank you for your collaboration with yeah. Mr. Santry to address that specifically in his last update because those are the things that happen. Parents wonder about it. People start to talk and the next yeah. thing you know, uh, you know, people are wondering, or rumors are out there, or things like that. So that was great to have it clearly and concisely addressed. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in you know, a communication that went directly to all middle school parents. That was great. And it's it's hard to control a lot of what's said because people come back. I, I say, 
you have to read the message, and, and that's what we've been doing. And I think our track record on it is very good. And I think just putting it out there early, um, and then I'll continue with updates. You know, right after we get all our numbers here, I'll send that out to parents and say we're still looking for students. We're still looking, and even if you know, I, I don't want to risk the fact that people think a team is full. You know, if you're a high school student, nine right. through twelve, no team is full until we have tryouts because we're adamant that nobody has a place on the team until they try out. We don't hold spots for students or anything else. At that, you know, nine through twelve, you're going to have to compete and hope. That's what we're looking for, really, is competition to get on our teams. That's what makes our teams more, better, and more competitive. Uh, we're not there in a lot of our programs yet, but it, we have been in the past and we will again. It, it's very cyclical with the numbers. So, do we need to vote on this? We have to vote. Um, are we at the vote place? Are we yes, you want to, you want to apply I'm asking for, you yeah, for, for permission to, to submit a waiver application for the fall, to, for the fall sports. And I will, I will ask, with your permission, for a blanket waiver across the board for all our sports teams in the fall. But knowing that, in all likelihood, there are probably several of those teams that we are not going right. to be seeking. Mm -hmm. But, and, and it, it's that tough situation because we don't know until we get there. Right. And I just make sure parents understand that there is that possibility that your son could play in the summer league soccer program you know, with all those kids on the team. And other kids could come out in the fall and potentially your child would not make the cut of the team or we wouldn't have room for an eighth grader right. on the team. Right. But I think there's, I don't really see it as a bad thing that eighth graders play during the summer with the high school students and that they go through even the tryout process and maybe still get cut from the program because the following year they'd be going through it again. It's sort of a quick or uh, a short lesson in how the whole program works and uh, the goal is to keep our high school sports as high school teams if we can. Mr. McCullough, I think sometimes there's a concern that um, there's this expectation that if the waiver is in place and eighth graders are coming out then there must be a chance for them to, to actually be part of the team. Yeah. Um, and then there's disappointment if they don't. Can you tell us how uh, your experience has been around that um, with the eighth grade students who would find out that no, there's not going to be space on the team? Well, um, I've had students and I've talked to students and their parents and for the most part when they come to me and I explain to them how it works, I mean, there is a process we have to follow and I have to ask for the waivers if we anticipate needing them before we really know the numbers. And in fact, yes, we will probably get the waivers because we have a good track record of not abusing the, the privilege. So um, it, it's just how the process is. I can't wait until August to ask for the waiver because they want 60 days right. before the season starts. Right. And I can't then just because we get the waiver I can't then break the rules and put the kids on the team if we don't need them. And that's the part the parents are confused about. Right. It's to feel the team. It's not just because we have a waiver. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, the number has to be that we need these kids to actually feel a team. Right. And, and in the league... And keep a program going. Right. As in right. the case of uh, softball. Uh, exactly. softball. Yes. And in the league, there's an understanding in the league amongst our, my fellow ADs that we will, they will not see us with hey, suddenly we have these, you know, really young kids, right. that are, even if they're exceptional players, and we're taking the place of kids that might not be as great a player, even if they're fresh in the sophomore. Right. But we, we're not going to do that. We, if we're going to cut one student who's in grades 9 through 12, then there are no 8th graders that can be on the team. clearly there's no need. Exactly. And it's not, the idea is not to bring talented students up mm -hmm. from the 8th grade. Right. It is simply to fill roster positions exactly. that are, would not be there otherwise. So would the goal be if, you know, for whomever, field hockey or soccer, if you have 38 or 39 kids, say, on soccer register, 
having eighth graders come to try out would well, not they wouldn't, right. would, wouldn't we, happen because at yeah. that point you have more than enough right. to field teams. The only reason that happened, that they actually, we, we, we gave an option of participating in the tryout was because right up to the sign up, right up through the Friday, or actually right. the Wednesday, and the season started on Thursday, we had several upperclassmen who had never turned in any paperwork, but showed up on day one or even on day two, at which point it pushed our numbers over what we had projected that we wanted for our minimum numbers. Uh, and we're not maxing our teams out, we're looking at a reasonable number of students because if we go take even more students on, then we have a bigger problem of playing time issues where you, you can't have 30 kids on one of your teams, uh, say on a varsity soccer, uh, soccer team or anything. You can't have it because you're not going to play 30 kids right. in a game and then you have students who are just are not going to play. Right. And we've set those numbers at a reasonable number. We're usually looking for between 34 and 38 kids. And some years it might be 34 and some years it might be 38, just depending on those 9 through 12 students and their skill levels. If you were looking at 34 and you had several uh, say ninth or 10th graders who were all about the same level of, of talent, then we're going to keep 38. Just so that we're not cutting that one or two right. kids and saying, hey, they're pretty close to right. each other. I'm going to cut, you know, I'd rather keep the upperclassmen, uh, but not adding the eighth graders into that mix unless we're head. So maybe the message across the board is that the goal is to fill the rot, like the communication is. The goal is to fill the rosters. If the roster cannot be filled with students from 9 through 12, then 8th graders will may be considered to be added to the roster. I mean, and that goes with, is that fair to say that goes across the board in all the sports? Yes. So that, that statement um, from whoever really is a clear and covers, should cover any sort of expectation that families have of what's going to happen in the upcoming season, whether or not they let students participate in tryouts or not would then be their decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you're, what I'm hearing you say is it's an experience. You want to come in, experience. you want to come and try and see what tryouts are like as an eighth grader and we, we might, we may or may not be able to put you on the roster, fine, but you can at least come and work, come on and try it out, try it out, see what it's like and then you'll be prepared for the next year. But I think that if our message just continuity across the board is uh, the goal of our athletic program is to fill the rosters for all of our fall, winter, and spring sports. We, the priority goes to 9th through 12th graders. If a roster can't be filled with that, then we will consider, consider filling with, with you know, 8th graders. And that's what the waiver and, and would allow us to do. Yeah. And that's what the waiver would allow us to do. I'm just saying it sounds like, and I'm not sure what the background is, but it sounds like there may be some confusion in the community yeah. about oh, yeah, there, what yeah. that is. And yeah. I'm not sure what the confusion, I'm not privy to but that. I think but just a waiver means that eighth grader will be able to try out. Right. So I think yeah. that in a general yeah. statement, and I don't know how that goes, but in a general statement across the board, if that's the message that we send from the school and the athletic department, um, that maybe parents will then see that that's relevant to all all sports in Lunenburg. This is our policy, you know, this is not our policy, but this is what the message is, and maybe we can clear some of that confusion. Yeah, and, and part of that confusion came about from when we went five years ago from being a 9 through 12 right. high school, right. we had the seek waivers. Suddenly we were an 8 through 12 high school. You don't have to seek waivers. 8th graders were, and we talked about that, and 8th graders were, had all the rights of the high school students so they could compete equally yeah. and they could take the spot of a 9 through 12 student. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, we had situations where they did. Mm -hmm. And suddenly now we're back to yeah. a 9 through yeah. 12 and that kind of gets lost when people over a four year, five year period, saw eighth graders were right, part of the right. team, so they start to think, well, when my son and daughter is in eighth grade, grade, they're going to, and yeah. so they don't necessarily understand that subtle change yep. that happened last year. I, I <laughs> yeah. think until it gets more into their nature, the, the new configuration, that right. we can't over communicate that message at yeah. this point. To be all the down avenues yeah. that we do it. Keep communicating it. Yeah, you cannot over communicate. Especially where sports are involved. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So we're looking for a motion, yes. Yes, we're looking for a motion to um, 
Make Grant a motion. Him, yeah, permission. Motion for uh, permission to submit a blanket waiver application for oh. for fall sports. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCullough, and mm -hmm. thank you, Mrs. Steele, I once will. again. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. This is very valuable. No, it is. You did, did a really <laughs> excellent job. I very understandable. Yes, thank you. And, 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 and I got all yeah. the rosters yeah. for the last several years, so I can stay in my Yeah, but now you have it, so right? It's fantastic. Yeah. 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 It's good data. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Have a good night. Okay, now we're going on to contract. Yes, I wanted to uh, let the committee know that the Lunenburg Paraprofessional Union um, did ratify the memorandum of agreement uh, for the new contract, which will be in effect from July 1, 2017 through June 30th, 2020. Uh, there are a few language changes within the document, adding some clarity. Um, we also added um, a small pool of money of professional development uh, to provide uh, for our paraprofessionals. There's a lot of that, uh, those opportunities that are offered here on site, but they're, they go on around the region and sometimes there's a cost um, associated with them. And we wanted to be able to encourage folks uh, to go out and receive a bit of uh, reimbursement for uh, whatever the fee might be for that. But it's limited to $3,000 a year. Um, so uh, it's, it's um, a, a, certainly a, an amount of money uh, that will be able to serve several of our paraprofessionals um, uh, as they go out and do that and just expand, uh, expand the expertise in that. We'll need the approval of their administrator prior to accessing that as well to make sure that what they're looking to go to and receive reimbursement for will inform their job. Um, also, uh, we also just clarified some things around uh, the sick leave language and personal time language, um, just some nuances of how it, it gets accumulated and, and um, making it more clear for everyone. Uh, we added two holidays uh, for the paraprofessionals in terms of paid holidays. The day after Thanksgiving and Veterans Day were added in. And overall, we did some uh, restructuring of year one with the high school um, paraprofessionals with uh, uh, that level of educational attainment was mo modified to reflect um, higher starting rates and respective set, uh, step increases. That actually was moving towards changes in the minimum wage um, level and wanting to make sure while we're not necessarily required as a governmental agency to meet uh, minimum wage, it's very hard to attract qualified uh, applicants um, if we're not paying minimum wage. So we restructured uh, that column um, and there's a, a licensed bachelors as well as uh, bachelors columns in the um, in the pair of professionals, so uh, we have those three levels of education within the columns as well, um, and two percent each year. So that's an overview of the contract that was ratified. We really appreciated uh, the opportunity to work with the representatives uh, from the union, and I recommend ratification to the committee. So I need to make a take a motion. Yes, I need to motion. To Motion to approve paraprofessionals MOA as detail. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So there are three copies of this document, all containing the signatures from uh, the paraprofessionals already. Um, the Lunenburg School Committee members sign on this right hand column, so three of them. Um, and that one will be taken care of and then we'll start uh, to, we'll integrate that into the overall document and uh, get that out to everyone including all of you okay. um, in the next couple weeks or month, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have the cafeteria? Yes, I do have um, also cafeteria employees uh, ratified uh, their agreement. Um, we did um, provide for uh, an additional vacation day for folks with um, uh, five or more years as well as um, an additional day for those uh, with less than five years. 
uh, vacation clarification of the vacation leave language, just so folks know how that's accrued and when it can be used. Um, the salary schedule was increased two, two, and two, and uh, we did an adjustment uh, similar to that of the paraprofessionals uh, with regard to this salary schedule as well. So. Uh, recommend uh, approval of that and their association or their group has approved it. Okay. So I'll take a motion. I make a motion that we accept the cafeteria uh, memorandum of understanding as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, and now the non affiliated agreement. Yes, this is a policy document. It's not a negotiated agreement. Uh, we do try to uh, to keep those individuals that uh, work under the non-affiliated agreement um, in terms of the uh, increase for these individuals. We're increasing to two and two as we did with the other uh, groups. Um, and we made some adjustments in the uh, starting uh, salaries as well. Uh, this covers um, uh, those um, various kinds of substitutes. It also carry, uh, uh, covers for us uh, the extended day uh, mm -hmm. personnel and um, our uh, cafeteria monitors also contained in the non-affiliated document uh, is the certified occupational therapy assistant and the greenhouse assistant uh, are contained within that. Um, so you had a red marked up version that shows us the changes and as I said uh, this is an internal policy document and so um, it's in, in force with the approval of this committee and I recommend the changes to you. So I'll take a motion. Motion, motion to uh, accept the non-affiliated agreements with changes. Do you have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, and you have the custodial one? We don't. We okay. uh, we'll okay. pass over that. Okay. Yep. And we have a nice donation. We do. Um, Mr. Uh, Starr and his family, and um, I did get his permission to uh, do this. He doesn't want a lot of publicity around it. I ask for him to allow us to perhaps acknowledge this with a plaque um, someplace. You know, uh, Mr. Uh, the Starr family did the donation that put another um, mobile lab over at Turkey Hill Elementary School at the start of this year, um, and he uh, and his family are making another donation of $11,425.15 and that will put um, the speaker system into the new stadium um, and um, you know his generosity the family's generosity is, is just overwhelming um, and we're uh, so appreciative of, of um, them helping us around these areas that we would be doing fundraising for many, many years in order to be able to, uh, to have these systems in place. So uh, it's with a great deal of uh, gratitude that I recommend uh, your acceptance of this donation. Motion, for that we motion to accept the donation from the Star family, $11,420. Thank you. There we go. I will second with the gratitude. Yes. All, all in favor, obviously. I agree. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. He said that was a big donation. It was. It's the wow. same gentleman that, uh, and the family. The family. He does it on behalf of the family. Um, and, uh, yeah. He says it's his intent to continue to help out where he can. So. Well, take it. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Former Lernenberg High School graduate. Oh, is that uh, what The family is? was here, and, and he talks about the education his children received in the district as wow. well. So, wow. That's amazing. Okay, public comments? No. Okay, so we going on to reports. Do we have any reports? Committee? Finance committee? No. No. PTO? No. 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 Capital planning? No. PACSAL? Lifelong learning? No. School council? No. No. Right. Policy sub? No. Wellness, no. No. Start time, no. no. But we need to make a meeting. We do, yeah. Because we got feedback on our survey. And the diversity committee. No, no. no. Okay, so topics for future discover discussion. 
We have those. Oh, and the dates are all good? Yes. For the calendar. We have a I quorum have for all the dates? Okay. That so I yeah, have the, decided. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The 19th, so the 2nd, and the 16th. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. Okay. Right? Correct. And our, um, we have goals set for the July 19th. Correct. Our goals. We need to have goals ready, ready to look at. Yes. yes. Both perhaps from the school committee as well as the superintendent. Yes. And um, I think our district strategic yes. plan is going to figure heavily yes. in yes. those. <laughs> so that's our main summer project. Okay. Great. Yeah. So we're going to adjourn. Yeah. Motion to, to adjourn, adjourn at 846. I got 45 apple time. 45. 845 Apple Time. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.